podcast public service announcement. You're about to hear an episode in the middle of a multi-part show arc. If you haven't heard the previous episodes, we suggest you skip back to part one of this topic in the feed and listen in order. All right, Paranoid Strain Orchestra, hit it. the Comte Saint-Germain. Is this another made-up guy like Christian Rosenkreutz? No, he's a real human being who definitely lived. And he was an alchemist, and apparently was fluent in Rosicrucian ideas, as were perhaps most educated men of his time. But beyond that, he's pretty hard to pin down. Listen, for example, to how these two YouTube videos by internet randos display varying degrees of credulity when relating the alleged details of his life. The Count of St. Germain was one of the most renowned figures of 18th century Europe. A confidant of kings, mysterious miracle worker and famous alchemist and astrologer, many stories and rumors surround this enigmatic nobleman. The Count used many names during his documented travels throughout Europe in the late 18th century, almost one for every country he visited. No one could determine where his wealth came from, but it was seemingly unlimited. On several occasions, he showed gorgeous jewels of unimaginable worth to royalty. Yet when he died, not a single jewel was found in his possessions. He debated philosophy with royalty across Europe, played the violin in London for the aristocracy, and was employed as a diplomat by King Louis XV of France. Some believed him to be born in the 1600s or even a thousand years earlier. Despite his true origin, nothing was known about the Count until he showed up in London in 1743. Some records indicate that it was even earlier than that. Once he became known, Saint Germain quickly impressed everyone he came across with his abilities. The Count could speak practically every European language and do so in a native accent to that language. He could also play the harpsichord, piano, and violin at a virtuoso level, performing in front of royalty, but his talents didn't stop there. The Count could also paint beautifully, he was a marvelous conversationalist, and a master chemist. In fact, he claimed to be able to remove flaws from diamonds and transmute metals, such as turning base metal into gold. Some speculate this is how he attained his wealth. You see, the Count was often adorned in diamonds, and was rich from the start. Yet nobody ever knew the origin of his wealth. It was said that he talked about history as if he was actually there. Because he did, some of the people around him were entirely convinced he was at these historical events. If that was true, it means the Count was either immortal, could reincarnate into different bodies while retaining his memory, or was some kind of time traveler. We'll never really know for certain, but my guess is that he had learned to preserve his body through the ancient knowledge he accumulated. But besides all that, the Count is also known for never aging. That is why Voltaire said he never dies. So you caught some hints of how the actual person behind legend became so legendary in the first place, but Churton helps us get a better picture of the Comte. He was probably the bastard son of Transylvanian Blah! and Bavarian royalty, and though he could not live the life of a true noble, had been offered sufficient inheritance and precious items he could sell off to maintain himself in high society throughout his life. This combined with his apparent gifts in a variety of areas, including, quote, Miraculous dyeing techniques, the removal of flaws from diamonds, the creation of a yellow metal called Similor, his interest in longevity, his peacemaking moves on behalf of the French government, and his general brilliance and philosophical acuity all combined to give him the luster of a great adept. The period in which he manifested, the era of high-grade masonry and neo-Rosicrucianism, rendered it certain that one such as he would enter the annals of legend. And then there was the fact that he was one of those select humans who just don't seem to age. Your Paul's Rudd, your Salma's Hayek, your Wilfred's Brimley. There's also the fact that he was never seen by anyone to eat a meal, 
probably because he was a vegetarian and therefore basically couldn't attend any formal dinners for fear of being rudely unable to partake of most courses. So you've got a mysterious itinerant nobleman who travels from court to court, dazzling everyone with his erudition, skill in an array of musical and visual arts, and obvious wealth, yet he comes from no traceable background that could explain any of this. Oh, and he never seems to age or eat. Yeah, that sounds like the setup for a lot of wild speculation among the landed gentry. Yes, indeed, especially since the Count, probably well aware of these rumors and questions about his mysterious self, would regularly feed the legend by relating stories of things that had happened a century or more in the past as if he were an eyewitness. And so he did become a legend, an immortal alchemist. Albeit one who deflatingly is known to have died in 1784. But what's a little dying to get in the way of immortality? And so the stories continued long after his death. Let's discuss one of those that hits close to home for us, yet another in the long history of murder and hauntings in New Orleans. Fast forward to New Orleans, Louisiana, and there appears a man by the name of Jacques St. Germain, who fits every description of the Count above. Around 40 years of age, with heavy money bags, the most fascinating of dinner guests, and still a complete mystery. He would throw lavish parties and invite the elite. Everyone would sit enraptured in the conversation and food, but curiously enough, this Jacques Saint Germain would never eat a morsel. But one night he had a lady stay a bit late, out on his balcony at the corner of Ursuline and Royal Streets. This Saint Germain grabbed her and tried to bite her neck. She escaped by falling from the balcony and then reported the incident to the police. When the police came to investigate, Jacques Saint Germain had vanished. They searched his apartment and found tablecloths with large splotches of blood on them. They searched the kitchen, where they found no sign of food or evidence that food had ever been there. All they found were bottles of wine. And, after pouring themselves a glass, drinking it, and then spitting it out, they discovered that it was not only wine in those bottles, but wine mixed with human blood. So now he's spending his time 150 years after he died drinking blood-laced wine and threatening women of loose morals. I mean, probably not, but spooky, right? Not really. Tough crowd. Okay, how about this one? The main reason the Count is still a going concern in modern occultist and mystical circles is because the 19th century founder of Theosophy... A movement we'll probably get to during our second long Secret Society series. Madame Helena Blavatsky decided that Saint Germain was, in point of fact, the continuer of Christian Rosenkreutz. In other words, as many followers took it, Saint Germain never aged because he was, in fact, the immortal Christian Rosenkreutz himself, reincarnated to live forever. In fact, theosophists consider Germain Rosenkreutz to be one of the ascended masters that are central to their claims about the universe. Regardless, the man served as a sort of avatar of the life extending mysteries of Rosicrucianism for first a generation of European nobility in the 18th century, and then again for a few generations of theosophists in the 19th and 20th century. And that's about all we're planning to say about that period of Rosicrucianism, partially because, as our authors note, the alchemical period has very little to do with the universalist aims of the original manifestos and their adherents. But even more, we want to move along to the final major historical element of the Rosicrucian story that we're going to focus on. That is, what happens when an ascetic, mystical, and esoteric universalist discipline meets the matchless, crass, unabashed world of American capitalism. Seems like CRC is about to get steamrolled. Maybe, or maybe not. As Professor Spence noted, the group is, in a sense, a very early incarnation of an extremely American phenomenon. The Rosicrucians were this mysterious group which just kind of surfaced out of nowhere and then eventually claimed to have a pedigree going back a couple of centuries before to their founder. But then, of course, even further than that, because he was simply bringing together doctrines that were timeless. So he was only discovering the wisdom of the ages and packaging it in a new form, which now the Rosicrucians were taking forward. The thing is, is that we have no documentation that anybody named Christian Rosenkreutz ever actually existed, that there was any society of his kind, that any of this was other than a kind of, you know, marketing invention of people who were advertising the secret society in the early 1600s. And if you think of the authors of the manifestos as marketers par excellence, selling the dream of a product they hadn't even bothered to actually invent, it seems as American as a baseball and apple pie multinational conglomerate. With cheese in the crust. Money's 
Speaking of Dr. Spence, let's let him bring us to the flowering of something that called itself American Rosicrucianism way back at the beginning of the 20th century. He begins the story explaining the history of Harvey Spencer Lewis, the founder and indefatigable marketer supreme of the ancient mystical order Rosé Crucis, which of course means Rosy Cross. Which we will from this point call the A-M-O-R-C or Amarc, because that other shit is too long. If you glance through old comics or pulp magazines like Amazing Stories, Popular Science, or Mechanics Illustrated, you're bound to come across Amorc ads offering to reveal ancient wisdom, the suppressed knowledge of the ages, the secret method for the mastery of life, and the psychic power of attraction. Whether you suffer from depression or just the vague feeling that there's something horribly wrong with the world, Rosicrucianism offers a cure. The secrets entrusted to a few could be yours, plus handy skills like levitation and telepathy, all for a low, low cost in easy lessons. Simply put, the mystical order's grand imperator, H. Spencer Lewis, turned it into a mass marketing empire, and it's still going. Lewis built his own empire on much older foundations, which he reinvented for the 20th century. Lewis's Rosicrucian adventure started with a vision. In the spring of 1908, then a 25-year-old struggling artist, Lewis claimed to have had a profound mystical experience. A spirit guide instructed him to journey east and seek out the Rosicrucians. The following summer, Lewis said he accompanied his father, Aaron Lewis, on a business trip to Paris. That started the young man on a journey that ended in the ancient city of Toulouse. The city had been a hotbed of the medieval Cathar heresy, which had challenged the Roman Catholic Church in the Middle Ages. Coincidentally or not, Toulouse remained a magnet for esoteric activity. And it's there, Lewis said, in an old chateau near the Garonne River, that a man named Count du Belcastel Lin initiated him into the Rosicrucian mysteries. The young American was given free access to the order's library and archives. He made notes and copied whatever he wished. But there was a catch. The Rosicrucians' mission for Lewis was to restore true Rosicrucianism to America, which he did, starting in New York. While he accepted the challenge, the masters, in their mysterious way, decreed he couldn't begin until 1915. Another vision later directed Lewis to California, where he restored Rosicrucianism to its new home in San Jose in 1927. That, in a nutshell, is Lewis's version of the founding of the ancient and mystical order of the Rosy Cross. So Lewis had one story about the way that he founded this group, but as Spence notes, there's plenty of reason to doubt that account. For example, there's no record whatsoever of Lewis or his father traveling to France in 1909 as he claimed. And remember, there are modern, archived, bureaucratic records of travel that historians can check. This isn't the legendary CRC heading to Damasco in the late 1300s. And there's evidence that Lewis was interested in esoteric topics a full six years before his supposedly life-changing journey and exploration of the Rosicrucian archives. In fact, Spence characterizes Lewis's life as rife with flimflammery. A description Jesuit loves so much he wishes he could eat it with a spoon. In his September 1918 draft registration, Lewis lists himself as manager of something called the Order Rosé Crucis. Some months earlier, he'd purchased the old Lily Langtree mansion on West 23rd Street. Where did he get the money? That's probably answered by a police raid on the mansion and Lewis's arrest in June 1918. He was charged with fraudulently selling thousands of dollars of bond certificates based on the claim that his order was a recognized branch of a worldwide institution devoted to the study of the occult. New York State rejected his application to incorporate the ancient and mystical order as an organization engaged in the analysis of all ancient, medieval, and modern religions, philosophy, and moral codes. That setback probably prompted his move to California. But Spence wasn't just flimflam. He really seems to have been into his highly unique and idiosyncratic vision of what Rosicrucianism was. But that doesn't mean he couldn't make a buck off of it. He was a consummate self-promoter, arranging in 1916 for a group of 27 followers to participate in a ceremony wherein he claimed to have transformed zinc into gold. Gold, I tell ya! Gold! Oh, I'm rich! I'm rich! Eureka! Gold! Not that, you know, any controlled experiment or unbiased observers were involved in this supposed miracle. Whatever Spence was doing, though, it worked out for him. The AMORC is, to this day, more than 80 years after Lewis's death, still a going concern. Paradox Digression. Well, 
kind of, but it's super interesting, touches on another topic we've been over previously, and will only take us a moment to discuss. Dr. Spence mentioned that part of Lewis's empire building involved advertising in magazines offering spiritual and practical solutions for modern problems through his group's ability to tap into ancient wisdom. Well, his son followed in the man's footsteps after the elder Lewis's death in 1939, and AMORC did a brisk business in the middle part of the century, sending out records and tapes to hopeful students seeking to better themselves. The group has been kind enough to reproduce some of these in podcast form, and so we can hear Harvey's son, Ralph M. Lewis, discussing the Akashic Records. Nope, we're not explaining what that means. Back in 1957. Prodders and sorors, the imperator of the Rosicrucian Order Amorc, Ralph M. Lewis. Brothers and sorors, the subject of the Akashic Records is one of great interest to our members. And yet, there seems to be some confusion as to what type of record they are. The Akashic Records are an abstract principle. They must not be construed as meaning a material record, a writing or inscription of any kind in the ordinary sense of the word. We mention this for two reasons. First, to note that many of the AMORC's audio releases involved self-hypnosis for spiritual enlightenment and self-improvement. And second, because one of the individuals who responded to Lewis's advertising and set about hypnotizing himself with these recordings was Sirhan Sirhan. That name sounds familiar. It should. The man who assassinated Robert Kennedy has been denied parole for the 15th time. The decision about Sirhan Sirhan's fate was handed down just 90 minutes ago. It's a story we... Oh yeah, you covered him back in the assassinations non-JFK episode, where you talked about how conspiracists believed that Sirhan was actually mind-controlled, either to shoot RFK or to stick around looking guilty while the real assassins got away. Exactly. And part of the supposed evidence of the conspiracy is that Sirhan was listening to or being forced by mind control to listen to those weird occult Rosicrucian records from the AMORC. We find this line of thinking utterly unconvincing. See the full episode for more details. Digression over. So AMORC was seen as part of the flowering of new agey spiritual beliefs in the mid-century, and aside from brushes with infamy like Sirhan, it was mostly viewed as a harmless, if somewhat flaky, pursuit. But for all of that, Harvey Lewis's brainchild has been pretty darn successful. In fact, it sports a rather impressive headquarters complex in California. Take it away, Dr. Spence, in his Great Courses lecture. If you're ever in San Jose, California, check out Rosicrucian Park. Covering a city block, it's hard to miss. Its centerpiece is an Egyptian museum full of antiquities. Egyptian-style architecture abounds, so of course, there are pyramids. One, festooned with esoteric symbols, marks the resting place of the park's creator, Harvey Spencer Lewis. It's a secret society theme park right in the middle of Silicon Valley. There's even a planetarium, and the headquarters of the society behind it all, the ancient and mystical order of the Rose Crucis, or Rosy Cross, or just Amark for short. Hey, wait, Jesuit, isn't San Jose, like, right down the road from the Jesuit compound? I mean, with traffic, it's about an hour away. So, shouldn't you probably go to this Egyptian museum and see what the fuss is about? I mean, probably, yeah. So I did. One Saturday in the summer of 2021, I headed to the stately yet ersatz AMORC complex to visit the Egyptian museum that Harvey Lewis and his organization founded and developed. Incidentally... We think it's a little weird that somebody who was obsessed with a true Rosicrucianism should have such a focus on ancient Egypt. If you'll recall the fictional biography of Christian Rosenkreutz, he only made a brief stop in Egypt to look at the plants and animals as he traveled between Damkar and Fez. But, you know, ancient Egypt, secret wisdom of the ages, yada, yada, yada. Quite. Egyptian Museum began in 1929 with our first artifact, RC number one a small statue of the lion-headed goddess, Sekhmet. Today, the collection includes over 4,000 authentic ancient artifacts, plus a handful of models that help to set the context for some of the galleries. Every artifact that you see behind glass is 
I'm not sure what I expected to find, but as advertised, the place is rife with both actual antiquities and mummified human remains, as well as copies of artifacts from such awkwardly non-Egyptian storehouses of ancient Egyptian treasures as the British Museum. Ah, colonialism. Yeah. One of the highlights is a recreation of an Egyptian burial chamber, which in parts is really impressively put together, and in parts is as convincing a replica as the mummy section of the county fair haunted house. Is Cleopatra. Then go to your app store. The asks questions. Did you ever steal a note from me? He asks Bob. No, responds the deceased. Did you ever hear water from your neighbor's fields? Did you ever use the use of your boat to a common person? Forty-two such questions are at, all of which must be answered no. If that is successfully done, and the heart does not weigh down with guilt, the deceased will be granted all of those things seen on the daily right wall. He or she will be judged an op, a justified spirit, and according to an ancient Egyptian funerary spell, And as you might expect, based on Lewis's and the Egyptians' shared obsession with the subject, there is also a well-curated alchemy display, which walks visitors through the various stages of both the physical and spiritual versions of the discipline. The goal is to introduce new life into the fetus created by the union of iron and cotton. The fifth round will depicts the operation of fermentation. It shows the birds of soul and spirit nesting in a tree, awaiting the hatching of their fertilized egg. The inscription means, you will discover. During fermentation, digesting bacteria create a spirit of alcohol. On the personal level, it is an influx of inspirational energy into the site. Brain number six is marked with a cipher for both the moon and silver. The goal is to purify materials by heating them and then condensing the vapors. On the personal level, it means repeated reflection and elevation of our thoughts and feelings. The next round will depicts the operation of distillation. It shows a unicorn... Okay, you build your setup. I guess it's time to make fun of the Amorx mystical alchemical nonsense? Yeah, that would fit my M.O., certainly, but I didn't feel that way traveling through these exhibits. Lewis maybe had the heart of a scammer, but he and the people who came after him were also genuine spiritual seekers. And while we don't put much stock in alchemy as a route to attaining the wisdom of the ancients, or some higher level of consciousness, there really is something very relaxing and pleasant about sitting quietly, looking deeply into the image representing alchemical cycles on the wall, and meditatively blissing out. Like grave. It is inscribed with the word lapidum, meaning the stone, which refers to the birth of the philosopher's stone. At the top of the ring, above the crown of the quintessence, is a winged figure known as the ascended essence. It signifies the completion of the spiritual work. The soul, now perfected, is ready to take flight to a whole new level of being. Now that you understand... Jess? Yeah? You're flaking on me? No, 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 no. Let's get back to the hard-nosed skeptical stuff. As we leave Lewis and the Rosicrucians generally, we want to quote Churton and his description of how Lewis's obsession with contacting the original, supposedly real Rosicrucians, or their descendants, is emblematic of a certain type. This urge seems to get right into some people's self-consciousness to the extent that they cannot imagine they're not of critical interest to the supernal order. Their lives are subsequently interpreted by themselves and their followers as being guided from on high. That observation nicely brings us to the last thing we want to talk about in this context, a big fat novel that many of you may have sitting unread on your bookcases right now. book is Foucault's Pendulum by the late Italian author and professor of semiotics, Umberto Eco. It was a hugely popular purchase in the 90s among lit and history-obsessed college types, but many people, including him, who picked up a copy during that period, may not have succeeded in conquering the rather dense text on their first tries. 
If you're one of those who never finished it, or if you can find a used copy at a thrift store, which always seems to have one or two, we strongly recommend you pick it up and dive in. We knew we were going to discuss the novel at some point in the series, but it wasn't really clear where. As it turns out, the followers of Rosicrucianism are a great place to talk about Eco's masterwork of conspiracy, because his protagonists are not only obsessed with the German Invisible Order, but also in their own way follow in Andre and company's footsteps, imagining a thing that then becomes real, only to see it immediately spin out of their control. In spite of its imposing length, the novel is such an exciting read, it's amazing that it hasn't been picked up by Hollywood for the Da Vinci treatment. There's murder, both secretive and ritual. In fact, several. And tales of the Templars. And, like, tons of historical research. And thoughtful conversations in bars and cafes. And meditations on constructing meaning in life. You know what? We can see why it hasn't become a blockbuster starring The Rock doing a very bad Italian accent. But there is a Brazilian sex ritual scene. Hot. Anyway, read it. Obviously, we're about to sprawl the fuck out of this novel, and so we want to tell you how far forward to skip if you're still planning to read it. But the thing is, we're not going to know how long the discussion is until after he edits the show together. In other words, long after he and I have recorded our parts. So in a moment, he's going to stick in a computer voice to tell you exactly how far to skip if you don't want spoilers. Please skip forward 11 minutes and 8 seconds to avoid spoilers. Also, drink more water. You look dehydrated. You're welcome. The plot centers on three underemployed editors and scholars who have fallen into the orbit of a publishing house that delivers two types of books. Lavishly printed, expensive tomes on esoteric, occult, and hermetic topics, on the one hand, and on the other, self-publishing the works of cranks who are too obsessed with their own ideas and supposed brilliance to notice that they're getting ripped off by the terms of the deal. Our narrator, Kasauban, is writing a thesis on the Templars when he is brought in to consult on the latest book in the latter category, a thesis claiming that the author, an elderly military man, has discovered an ongoing secret plan by the Templars to take over the world. Said author soon disappears under strange circumstances, the book project is dropped, and Kasauban moves to Brazil with a woman he's infatuated with. There he meets the mysterious Aglier, an elderly man who strongly implies that he is none other than the Comte de Saint-Germain. Though that figure's reputation was built not only on his supposed immortality, but also his eternal youth. Details, details. Upon Casalbon's return to Italy, several years later, he and his companions reunite and decide it would be fun to make a game out of creating their own overarching conspiracist master plan. So they feed the military guy's manuscript, along with some Kabbalistic literature and various other factoids, into the office computer. These factoids they enter are listed out in the text, and we found they closely resembled an unrelated recent phenomenon in which an anonymous soothsayer drops seemingly random pearls of wisdom that followers then transform into an overarching plan. See if you catch our drift. The Templars have something to do with everything. What follows is not true. Jesus was crucified under Pontius Pilate. The sage Omas founded the Rosy Cross in Egypt. There are Kabbalists in Provence. Who was married at the Feast of Cana? Minnie Mouse is Mickey's fiancé. It logically follows that. If. The Druids venerated black virgins. Then. Simon Magus identifies Sophia as a prostitute of Tyre. Who was married at the Feast of Cana. The Merovingians proclaim themselves kings by divine right. The Templars have something to do with everything. Ah. You're using our beloved computer guy to imply the similarity between this deliberate nonsense and the anonymous Q drops that feed the QAnons. Point taken. But what do these guys plan to do with their computer-generated conspiracy? It appears they do it mostly for their own amusement, with the vague idea of writing a book aimed at their conspiracist audience that will seem super believable to those credulords due to the scholar's in-depth knowledge of the overall subject. The plan that they generate based on the computer's output is, of course, completely fucking ridiculous, and starts with Pangea. The fuck is a Pangea? That's that period hundreds of millions of years ago when all of the world's continents were one big supercontinent. Please don't bother trying to figure this out too much. But weren't there no people when Pangea was a thing? Yeah, but to be fair to this plan, humans only missed it by like 175 million years. Now, stop with the logic. The original ancient masters back in Pangea days... Those masters were presumably dinosaurs? Stifle it, unicorn. Anyway, they understood how to manipulate the energy of the Earth itself, which the guys creating this conspiracy decided to call telluric currents. Said ancient masters presumably used their tiny little useless T-Rex arms to carve this information in coded sigils into Ayers Rock in modern-day Australia, then passed along their secrets to the Atlanteans. 
Of course. Who then passed it to the ancient Celts, who built megaliths like Stonehenge on the Telluric power lines, but they had only part of the secret. The rest belonged to the Egyptians, who passed it on to the Jews, who codified it in the measurements of Solomon's temple, and then into the Pentateuch. That is, the first five books of the Bible. In a cipher that only the enlightened could crack. Jesus learned this from the Essene mystics, which is why he got crucified, but then Joseph of Arimathea... The guy who helped carry the cross and or offered his own tomb for Jesus' body after the crucifixion, depending on the gospel you read. Brought this secret to the Celts. This was the real Holy Grail. Hear that? Suck it, Mary Magdalene! But hold your horses. There's still another piece missing, which was passed on by original temple rabbis to the Ismailis and the Sufis, who then passed it to the Templars. And that secret is the location of the navel of the world, the control room from which this telluric energy can be manipulated to control the weather, create natural disasters, etc. The power is the philosopher's stone that the alchemists sought as well. And the conspiracy part is, the Templars have plotted their revenge since King Philip burned Jacques de Molay in 1314. That revenge involves a plot to find this control room and use it to just fuck up their enemies. Presumably the French and the Catholic Church. But also to take over the world! But because the knights got split up after they were officially dissolved, each Templar group across the world only has one piece of the puzzle. Every 120 years, a clue leads one group to contact another. Eventually, the Templar's descendants would have connected everything and unlocked the secrets. But this 120-year cycle broke down somewhere, and only our intrepid Italian scholars were able to crack the secret. Mostly because they made it up. And it turns out the secret the Templars were trying to reconstruct over the centuries was the precise time, date, and location when a Foucault pendulum... Which is a real thing. A free-swinging pendulum that over time moves in a complete circle and can be used to prove the Earth is rotating. We'll point the way to the secret Earth control room location. So the Templars are now just James Bond villains. I mean, kind of, yeah. The book is, at its root, a parody of the conspiracist view of history, while at the same time a very humane consideration of the reasons that people come to these bizarre, intricate, unlikely views of the world. So of course the theory these guys come up with is silly. They intend it to be. But then once they've created it, they start to see signs that maybe at least parts of it are true. Mysterious people are taking an interest in them. Some of the signs that they themselves made up about the plan coming to fruition start to really happen in real life. And understandably, this leads them to some ruminations on how engaging in this type of thinking, even as a purely amusing exercise, can inadvertently change the way you see the world, even if you're the one who invented the whole thing. As one of the characters notes, any fact becomes important when it's connected to another. The connection changes the perspective. It leads you to think that every detail of the world, every voice, every word written or spoken has more than its literal meaning that tells us of a secret. To prove this point, two characters have a dialogue where they use this assumption of the complete connectedness of things to read a world-spanning conspiracy into an automotive manual. You'll of course see all of this is particularly appealing to one fearful Jesuit. Trying to grok why conspiracists think the way they do is one of my fundamental obsessions. And the reason why I tend not to buy into these ideas is nicely encapsulated by this quote from the novel. Not that the incredulous person doesn't believe in anything. It's just that he doesn't believe in everything. Or he believes in one thing at a time. He believes a second thing only if it somehow follows from the first thing. He is nearsighted and methodical, avoiding wide horizons. If two things don't fit, but you believe both of them thinking that somewhere hidden there must be a third thing that connects them, that's credulity. The book is sympathetic to believers in conspiracy and magic, and there are a few scenes where seemingly inexplicable mystical things happen. Ghostly figures appearing out of emanations from mystics in a trance, for example. But nothing that can't be explained away as the hallucinations of human beings pushed to extremes. Fundamentally, though, it's a celebration of both the real and imagined history of the secret society groups that we've covered, and others that we'll cover shortly and a warning about the risks of thinking in a paranoid or conspiracist way. One of the most poignant passages comes during a conversation between Kasabon and his pregnant girlfriend, who is frustrated by his obsession with the made-up plan and his worry that it's coming true. She quickly demolishes the secret meanings that the supposedly wise assign to various concepts, showing how they derive not from the wisdom of the ancients, but the practical experience of innumerable generations of humans simply living their lives on Earth. Archetypes don't exist, the body exists. When somebody wants to invent something beautiful and important, it has to come from there. Because you also came from there the day you were born. Because fertility always comes from inside a cavity. And high is better than low, because if you have your head down, the blood goes to your brain. Because feet stink and hair doesn't stink as much. 
because it's better to climb a tree and pick fruit than end up underground, food for worms. That's why up is angelic, and down is devilish. The sun is good because it does the body good, and because it has the sense to reappear every day. Therefore, whatever returns is good, not what passes and is done with. As in a circle, everybody can see the one who's in the center, whereas if a whole tribe formed a straight line like a squad of soldiers, the people at the ends wouldn't see. And that's why the circle and rotary motion and cyclic return are fundamental to every cult and every rite, standing up during the day, lying down at night. The vertical position is life, pointed sunward, and obelisks stand as trees stand, while the horizontal position and night are sleep, death. All cultures worship many years, monoliths, pyramids, columns, but nobody bows down to balconies and railings. Did you ever hear of an archaic cult of the sacred banister? Unfortunately for Kasaubon and his friends, the reason that they think the absurd plan is coming true is because, in a sense, it is. A group of rich cultists whom they call the Diabolicals, and which includes the pseudo-Saint-Germain, Aglier, have all decided that these academics have stumbled upon the true, real plan that people like them have been looking for for centuries, and therefore these Diabolicals begin kidnapping and murdering everyone who knows about it, culminating in an absurd scene where they execute Kasaubon's friend at midnight in a hall in the Musée des Arts et de Métier. They expect this sacrifice to reveal the secret location to them. When it doesn't, they don't decide to abandon their quest, but rather set their sights on Kasaubon himself, who, as the novel ends, is coming to terms with the fact that he will likely die at the hands of these idiots, all because he and his friends invented a silly conspiracy theory. But it turns out there is no conspiracy too silly for people to believe it. And just as with the Rosicrucians, simply believing a proposition is true can cause believers to work to make it come true. As we move to our next topic, we have one more quote from Kasaubon, realizing what he and his friends have accidentally done, a thought that we all might benefit from keeping in mind. When we traded the results of our fantasies, it seemed to us, and rightly, that we had proceeded by unwarranted associations, by shortcuts so extraordinary that if anyone had accused us of really believing them, we would have been ashamed. We consoled ourselves with the realization, unspoken now, respecting the etiquette of irony, that we were parodying the logic of our diabolicals. But during the long intervals in which each of us collected evidence to produce at the plenary meetings, and with the clear conscience of those who accumulate material for a medley of burlesques, our brains grew accustomed to connecting, 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 everything with everything else, until we did it automatically out of habit. I believe that you can reach the point where there is no longer any difference between developing the habit of pretending to believe and developing the habit of believing. So, where to next? Why, to the most important and fundamental secret society of all, the one you can't help but run into when researching any other secret society throughout history. The one that has not only mythic origins, but literally centuries of verifiable, impactful international history behind it. And the one your grandpa might have proudly been a member of. Oh, the Freemasons. you could go back in time to the Saturday mornings of your childhood, eating cereal and watching your favorite cartoons? Well, we don't provide the cereal, but we do have a cartoon time machine to take you to animated shows of the past, present, and future. And even just some stuff that doesn't exist, but wouldn't it be cool if it did? We're your animates, Katie and Scarlett, and we'd like to invite you to join us on our podcast, Cartoon Time Machine. 
releasing new episodes of Cartoon Fun Times every Sunday morning. We're two film majors who love to talk cartoons and get way too into them. So if you want to hear two adults getting way too invested in the world of Steven Universe. Or answering the age old question of whether Sugar Mama would beat General Amaya in a fight. Or just trying to figure out what Tom Kenny voiced in every show. Tune in to Cartoon Time Machine, part of That's Not Canon Productions. See you there.